are listening to part two of our three-part symposia with Alan Abadessa Green. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Alan Abadessa Green. Susan, Sabelle, and Chipper will be joining our conversation. Alan is an author, researcher, and editor of Sync Book One, Myths, Magic, Media, and Mindscapes, and Sync Book Two, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. Both books explore synchronicity and synchromysticism through the writings of authors within the Sync community. This community is defined as a community committed to exploring the impossible. Alan is well versed in contemporary myths, memes, and synchronicities, revealing amazing insight into ourselves, our culture, and our world. Thinkbook Radio features two weekly podcasts, 42 minutes, and always record with an archive of conversations and interviews with some of the most intriguing minds. Additionally, Alan is the author of a blog titled Look at All the Happy Creatures in his soon-to-be-released book, Suicide Kings. Alan, let's move on to a discussion of synchronicity. Hi, Alan. This is Sabelle. Could you describe looking at synchronicity through right or left brain, so through the the artist or the the logician, the log- logic person? Sure, yeah. I think... Uh, you know, again, I can only speak so much for the left-brained <laughs> perspective. I might not be its best representative, but uh, I do think I've I've learned how to balance it um, pretty darn well. So let's say um, I know this was another uh, topic you guys wanted to get to was the idea of you know understanding which patterns are important or which synchronicities you don't want to just get lost down a rabbit hole. This is where a left brain perspective might be useful, is to say how to bring it back in. What are you reeling back in? To me, I think of the right brain, this this id, the subconscious. We're like going swimming or fishing. That's what our right brain is for. We can explore and we can see how everything's interconnected. We can find treasures. We can find, you know, sea monsters too. We can find some really dark things hiding there. But this is a place to explore and really go off the map. Left brain is some, is a place that has a value. A lot of people don't, you know, oh, left brain's... I, there's a beautiful image uh, that someone made which shows a man's head opened up. And on the left side, it's all like cubicles and gray office workers. And on the right side, it's like people playing in the park and flying kites. And it's a beautiful, beautiful image. But it's also a little, I think, biased. You know, the left brain has its purpose. It's not just cold corporate mechanical. To an extent, yes. But the point, it's the same thing when we talk about ego. You know, I'm, I'm all for ego death experiences. But we don't want to villainize the ego. We have to understand its function. This is our challenge. You know, it's easy to kill an ego, you know. Grab some LSD. Well, you know, we can take care of this in a few minutes. The hard part is putting it back together and figuring out how to use it. So, you know, this idea of what is the function of the left brain, what is the function of the ego, this is our challenge. I think for, for us right now, maybe the mainstream world, there might be some people, there's probably a lot of people actually in the corporate environment. I've worked in corporate environments years ago. I couldn't do it anymore. There's a lot of people who could use a lot of right brain but I think within our environment, you know, I guess maybe I shouldn't overgeneralize. I guess I'm, I just deal with a lot more artists. I deal with a lot of artists who I feel like need some left brain. <laughs> when I worked in a corporate environment, I dealt with a lot of left brain people who needed more right brain. Uh, yeah. I come down to everything that when I search my heart and I do my research and everything that I do, everything comes back to the answer of we need to find some balance. So to say... In that respect, we have to find what is it maybe lacking for us. I think the people on this call, we might be, uh, I'm, again, I don't want to overgeneralize, but it sounds like we're people comfortable with right brain thinking. Sometimes we might need to reel that in a little bit. And then, as I said, same, same for the, the opposite would be true. I think of it as, uh, when I say this idea of like going fishing, is... There was something Terrence McKenna made a joke about, which I thought was really, really funny, but also deeply profound. He said when we, he was so in the psychedelic experience, he says, when we go in through these experiences, we're looking to bring something back from them. 
you know, we are the explorer or the fisher that's going to go and bring something back. He says, we don't want to bring back ideas that are too small. Like, and he makes the joke, uh, it's something like, did you ever notice that your finger is the same size as your nostril? And he's like, not these small realizations <laughs> that you might have. And also, though, not something too big that you can't deal with it. I've, we, I, don't, I don't know, I've had them myself. You have this profound insight, and you're struggling to try and convey it to someone, and it comes across as gibberish. And maybe you haven't even finished processing it, yet, you know, it yourself. So it's these huge ideas that you don't know how to really begin to even boil down or, or how to apply them. It's just this epiphany of, oh, do you realize? Well, what can you do with that? That, that has value, but it might require some time to process. So this other thing is, what is a medium-sized idea? This was McKenna's point. What's a medium-sized idea that we can bring back? And the more I do this, the more I come back to that phrase of his, uh, that medium-sized idea, because I've done, you know, swimming and deep-sea diving in the subconscious. I will continue to do that. I think it's immensely valuable. And then I, I've, after in the last few years, dealing with people who I think are having a really hard time integrating a lot of those huge ideas, I've started focusing on putting some ground back beneath people's feet and saying, okay, maybe we need some medium-sized ideas. Maybe we need to go back to some basics. And maybe we just need to like plant our feet on the ground a little bit and say, okay, how do we begin to integrate these things? Because ultimately... We don't want to just be... I think you guys are having Neil Kramer next week, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love Neil Kramer. Neil's in the first sync book, by the way. I love Neil's work. Uh, big fan of his. Neil has a, a funny expression. He calls them woo-woo space bunnies. He says, we don't <laughs> want to end up as woo-woo space bunnies. And that's exactly what I'm point talking about. It's like, we can go so far into this creative, artistic, imaginative, right-brained world... And I've met people who don't know how to turn that off, and they're not, you know, they're not very integrated people. I'm, I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just saying they're not, you know, try and get that person to. Uh, they're lopsided. Meet a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the left of brain's kind of good for paying the bills and remembering to feed uh -huh. the cat. And that yeah. Stuff. yeah, I mean, we're, to an extent, we're probably all lopsided, but you know, some of us more so than others. So. Yeah, you know, the guy who's the CEO who's, you know, forgot, uh, you know, hasn't seen his children in six years because he's worried about uh, something, you know, some cold corporate thing, he's lopsided. I'd probably still rather hang out with the guy who's right brain lopsided, probably a little more fun, but ultimately no more balanced than, than the, the CEO, you know, the corporate CEO. So ultimately what we want to do is find a way to balance these two things. So, yeah, feed the cat, pay your bills, and then you can go fishing again. And you go fishing and you can go swimming. And you can explore all these, these things and find a way to bring them back. There is a point to the ego. There is a point to the left brain. Just you have to understand its function. You know, uh, this is, again, this is Neil Kramer. He says the, the ego should be the, the servant or the caretaker of the sort of body politic. And as long as it's put in its right place, in its right role, it shouldn't be something to, to demonize in any way. And I, I just think it's a really important reminder for, uh, I think, a lot of people in this. Um, I'm hesitant to say, you know, over overgeneralize to say it's, this is a new age field, but there's there's definitely a lot of that. And again, again I'm, not, I'm not trying to be hard on the new age. I'm just saying. The pendulum might have swung a little too far. <sighs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, I'm trying to find a really polite way of saying, it. yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Well, and, and how to, you know, use all the tools in our toolbox, you know, and not throw some out. Yeah, please. Yeah, that, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly right. And again, this, this, this can be just as true for the, the, the person who's too left brain oriented. I mean, it's funny. Um, my father-in-law, he's, he's an engineer. You know, he, he, oh, we always joke that he's the most left brain person. He's like, uh, he's like, I didn't even know I had a right brain until I was, you know, 50 years old or something. You know, we, and he, wonderful man. And, um, he joking around. And now he goes out and does theater. He, like, he acts and does singing and dancing. 
and because all his daughters, he has four daughters, and they're all. Uh, my wife's a ballet dancer. Uh, her sister's a gymnast. Other sister does, you know, uh, theater. It's like so. He saw his children doing all this stuff again. Notice it's the feminine, right? He saw these four young girls, his daughters, exploring and playing in all these realms, and he suddenly went, "Oh, that looks like a lot of fun. Let me practice that. Let me play with that." <laughs> and uh, he's having seems to be having a great time doing it. But of course. It's that this is the alchemical marriage. Uh, Susan wrote here in the Skype, discovering our other half. Yeah, this is the point of the alchemical marriage. So, you know, the, if we're too masculine, we need some femininity. If we're too feminine, we need some masculinity. And it doesn't have to be so literal as that. It's also left brain, right brain, all, all, these, all these different things. I think whenever we see these polarities, we can get... I think we're so used to this like political dialectic of, oh, it's Republican or Democrat, and we see the polarities. These are fake polarities. You know, they're probably not a good example, but it's something to avoid being stuck too much in one of these these sides. Any one-sided argument for anything is probably erroneous. But if we can find a way to balance some of these ideas, and that doesn't mean, you know, compromising basic values. I'm sure there's some someone out there with a strong political feeling saying, ah, oh, relax. What I'm saying is use your brain and your heart. This is, this is the, the ultimate answer, is learning how to be integrated physically and spiritually. An, an expression I've been saying for the last few years is, you know, this idea of like head in the sky. It's like have your head in the sky and your feet on the ground. Oh, I like find that. A, find a way to do both. This is the alchemical marriage. This is what you know. Every philosopher, every alchemist, every everything has been striving for since the dawn of man. We still have a, tr- a tremendous amount of work to do, uh, but it doesn't mean we should stop trying. Isn't that the yeah. point of integration? I mean, isn't that the yeah, yeah. Uh, to to be at the center of this field that we exist in, regardless of the parameters you set to that field, whether it's you individually or me or us together or or you in relation to people you, you work with and live with. I mean, the common center that each of us has being recognized and lived in. Very, very, very well said. Here's, a, here's one of those big unwieldy ideas I will throw at you just for the sake of because it's there, it's, and it's true, and we, this is something we have to wrestle with, is something synchronicity seems to show us is it's all center. Hmm. You know, and it's kind of like this Zen little puzzle of how do you, you know, this sort of Zen con of like, all right, what do you do with that? If it's, it's all, you know, is there a way to really be out of center if it's all center? I think that's a... Uh, you know, not 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 to throw a monkey wrench into this conversation, but to say these are the big ideas, these yeah. are the big unwieldy ones, and well, you gotta I ask think the what's big more ones too, though. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Just in order to stretch the, the <laughs> capabilities of perception. Absolutely. So this this is our challenge right now. Is um, you know how do you have this conversation where we obviously all see this need to find some center within us. And then how do you, you know, how do you, how do you balance that thought? Again, you know, how do you, how do you balance that understandable, digestible thought with, well, in fact, it's, it's all center. This is something uh, I'll just give you a, it's particularly in synchromysticism. I, I spoke earlier how a lot of people come at this from some media analysis because it's some, again, it's shared synchronicity. It's shared dream uh, logic. It's all these sorts of things. But something that I think a, a conversation that happens a lot, since there are uh, a section of, of this community that focuses on media, something that happens is, well, you can find truth in anything. So we've reached a point where come out with like the, the worst, worst pop culture music video and you give it to a skilled synchromistic and they'll show you how that music video encodes the entire world. There's no high art and low art anymore. There's no, um, even the things that seem to be in a way imbalanced or, or, or garbage still contain, uh, you know, it's, it's a fractal. You, you can't take 
the everything out of your garbage. Right. If you look, if you look into, you know, go into a sewer, find me the grossest thing you can think of, and it still contains all the beauty of the universe. So how do we balance that with this truth, this really deep, profound truth, which, wow, everything's beautiful. You know, there's this, there's this, we can find the meaning of life in the garbage can. It's true. And then the other question is, and do you just want to spend all your time looking in the garbage can? <laughs> you know, this is, this, is the, this is the hard question because it's like these guys who they can look at media and say, see, it's all in here. There's no, there's no low art. There's no this. There's no this. And then it's like, okay, yeah, you've proven that to me. And you've also spent the last year swimming in the worst pop culture garbage imaginable. Is there something more desirable? We've, if we've proven that it's all in one respect – the same, and I, it's a, it's, it's a right. really poor way of wording it, but right. you know what I mean. If on that holographic universe level, if it's all an echo of itself, what's the difference? It's the intent you bring to it, isn't it? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very, very well said. Very well said. So this is, I mean, ultimately what I'm sharing with you guys is that we are a community that has raised a lot of excellent questions. I think as a community, we've answered a lot of excellent questions, but what I'm also trying to clue you in on is where there's disagreements and where there's, I think, excellent questions being raised. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot more of debate and, and questioning going on somewhat behind the scenes than I think, uh, and just sort of trying to give you a little bit of both sides of that. So what have you noticed about how women and men see and work with synchronicity differently? How do they notice things differently? What, what do they bring to the conversation differently? Okay, there, there, are some, <laughs> there are some disagreements on what that ultimately means. But I can, as a man, I can only speak as a man, uh, as much as I've tried to integrate my feminine nature, um, I'm still stuck uh, speaking as a man. It seems to me, having observed this community, we do, we do notice that there are more men into synchro mysticism than there are women. We have plenty of amazing women who contribute to, to this, definitely in the minority. And sometimes this question gets bandied about, why is that? And from observing it, it seems to me that since women are probably more inclined and sort of um, it's more natural for them to be in that subconscious feminine perspective of this, this especially a lot of what we do is intuition-based. Um, we haven't really covered that, but what we're building with synchromysticism, I think, comes down to really building a sense of, of, of intuition. Well, feminine intuition it sort of comes with the package. So a lot of times uh, we've, uh, we've even done gatherings where a few of us get together. And the first one we got together two years ago over the summer, about, uh, ooh, I don't know, I think about 10 of us got together and there was like, you know, like probably like seven or eight guys to two to three women. Oh, it was, okay, it was three women, I remember, because we, we kept having a synchronicity with the three graces. The sort of three of cups tarot card kept coming up, and we kept talking with the three graces. So, yeah, it was three women and I guess about seven guys. And the guys would be going on and on and on about exploring some rabbit hole or some, you know, academic idea or something from the, from the head. You know, you're trying where would arguing and trying to, to rationalize all this stuff, right? Where the, where the ego is, where the left brain, at least in this equation, for, for all that we're right brain artists, we're trying to rationalize it and figure it out and discuss it and all this stuff. And the woman just sort of, you know, women sort of nod and go, uh-huh, yeah. And, you know, hey, there's dishes in the sink or yeah. And there's like a sort of a duh, you know, like, of, of course, of course, all these things are, you know, everything you're saying is true. And I think for, for the guys, it's sort of um, they're trying to figure out what that means and not to put women on such a, such a high pedestal. I mean, of course, women deserve uh, a lot, a lot of credit. But just to say, I don't think it's that women are better in, in any way. It's just that this does seem to come more naturally, particularly the intuition stuff and sort of understanding it on a non head level when you have to understand something in, in a way with your with your heart or your body rather than just understanding it in your in a rational brain sense this seems to come very naturally to women Every, you know this is kind of common sense in that respect and it's just really funny to see some of these interactions sometimes where the the the, the women are like yeah uh-huh and 
<laughs> so I yeah, think the I men are see, learning. Yeah, I could see men getting all excited in the discovery and women going, yeah, but how do you use that? Yeah, which is funny because this is uh, a very literal expression of the concepts we've been talking about, right? Here's a man who's discovering what it means to have his feminine nature. Oh, I get it. I get what intuition is. I get what your heart is. I get what all these things are. And he's excited. And then the woman who that comes natural to, what is her question? She says, I want to know how to apply this because that's what she's not used to, right? Mm-hmm. She, this, is, this, is this, this is the right brain asking, all right, yeah, and what do I do with it? She's exp- that's, when a woman says, well, what do we do with it? That's her exploring the left brain. That's her exploring the rational. I oh, think that, that, get, that, gets, that gets missed, I think, uh, very often. That's why she's interested in discovering the left brain just as much as the man is interested in discovering the right brain. To, to, to simplify it as right brain, left brain. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that. So to use a kind of a, a left brain then, how do you use intuition to sort through competing information, say on the internet or at the grocery store? Well, how do you use the left brain for that? It's a really or the good intuition. Question. Oh, so okay, it, yeah. It's, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah see, that's just it. I think, again, we talked about, you, uh, I think it was you who used the expression of the tools in your toolkit. I yeah. think what we need to realize is that's what this, for lack of a better term, this is what our right brain toolkit is for. I think last time I spoke to you guys, we talked about the Cliff High web bot and how, yeah. you know, which I, I really appreciate what he's trying to do. But what I see as a sort of built-in flaw is a computer is going to be logic-based very, very much. And trying to use a computer to to shuffle through all this data, it's only going to be able to come up with a logical answer. Or, or, you know what I mean? Like, you can come up with a pattern, but someone still has to interpret that pattern. Something along those lines. Whereas... Perhaps what separates us from machines is our ability to have some sort of intuition. And I, I put a question mark on that because I don't know what machine consciousness is. Um, and I think that's an excellent question that we're going to be wrestling with for the next thousand years. It might sound um, a little heady, but I really do mean that. We don't know what machine consciousness is. and we, uh, So it's very possible that a computer could have intuition or could develop it in time. We don't. However know what human consciousness is. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. So, you know, know thyself first, uh, or or at least attempt to. But using that at least as a metaphor, this is as close, we don't don't know what human consciousness is, and we don't know what machine consciousness is. But using this as a sort of example, I think that the web bot, at least in its, you know, sort of prototype form, is flawed in the sense that this is coming at it in a left brain perspective, trying to figure out, and I, 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 should, I should back up there because Cliff has explained it as the way he thinks it works is it's picking up on people's intuition. His thing was that, um, I heard him say once, if you, you might get more valuable data out of a cooking forum because people are unknowingly psychic. So the people yeah, discussing their... Leaking. Yeah, exactly. So you're using the left brain to pick up on some of that psychic leakage from the you know, unintentional right brain activity of some woman on a cooking forum. It's fascinating. I mean, seriously, I find it fascinating. What we're doing, though, is kind of cutting out the middleman. This is developing an intuition where I don't know how to really, you know, I, I don't have some sort of yogic manual. I can I can explain it. And I should give very fair warning, the sync book is not, okay, now meditate on this, and I can't teach you exactly how to develop this ability. All I can say is that when you start to open yourself up to this and start to play with the symbolic nature of the world, the dreamlike logic of 3D reality, when you start playing with these things, then you are able to start to develop some way of interacting and then recognizing how it works. I mean that very literally. It's as if some new part of your brain, and again, this is me speaking as a man, but it's as if some new part of your brain is sort of turning on and you start to see an extra layer of something. Oh, okay. It's just the same way you learned math or whatever, except you you can't make it such a literal textbook. This is abstractions. I think after about 
seven months, what I noticed is I would I used to be a huge news junkie, and I would constantly be reading the news. And then I noticed at some point that what I would do is I would look at a news article, and I wouldn't even read the whole article. I would it was almost as if like two words on the page were highlighted to me, and I'd see you know this whole body of text, and it's like for some reason the word as a probably a poor example, the why is the word frog on this page stand out to me? You know, this is an article about uh, an article about the White House or something. You know, why, 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 is, why is this word frog kind of, sort of highlighted to me? I'm a guy who doesn't like sports. I've just never been interested in sports. I found myself start clicking on sports stories because like, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, why is, why is uh, frog standing out to me? And then I'm looking through the news and I see that there are some sports team named the frogs or something and then I'm like okay let me read that story and I click over to the frog story and start noticing something that stands out there that connects back to that White House story and it's just in this sense it's it's in this weird abstract that I'm I'm very sorry I can't really explain how it works but there's something again this is intuition where you start picking up on something to use another McKenna, it's the wiring under the board, he would call it, right? You somehow start peeling back that curtain. You know, this is the, you can call this the veil of ISIS, peeling back the curtain on the on reality. Even the, the conspiracy crowds, they always say, you know, you're peeking behind the curtain to see who's the mastermind. Well, ultimately, what a lot of us come out of a conspiracy mindset uh, or, or have gone through these conspiracy phases. And the only reason I think that I don't, I'm not on your show right now telling you about uh, some conspiracy. It's not that I don't think they're real uh, or, or aren't important. If you peel back the layer on 2000, the year 2000, we peeled back the layer on reality and we said, oh my God, there's you know, all these banks and mega corporations actually running our government. And these were the, this was the wiring under the board. This was, we peeled back the curtain and we saw you know, the Wizard of Oz isn't really this big booming voice. Oh, he's this little schmucky guy. And then what happens when you go into the room with the little schmucky guy who's actually not this grand wizard but the humbug and you actually peel back that layer and you say, wait a second, it's not actually being controlled. You know, this whole universe is not being controlled by the Federal Reserve. This is being, you know, they, they're very powerful in one respect but only to a point. And this is a, peeling back another layer and another layer and another layer. So it's, so it's, it's almost like once you peel back a layer, you don't need to look at it anymore. Now you're looking at the next layer. And so at least my experience of – because the internet is – there's so much out there. I find now that there's stuff that I just skip over that I used to – oh, I want to find out about that. I don't mean this is a cop-out, but we, we, do, we do need to be balanced. We're pausing this conversation to allow our guests to tell you about their activities and how you can learn more about them. Alan, tell us about other events in which you were involved and where one can purchase your books. Oh, thank you. My website is syncbookpress.com, or you can go to thesyncbook.com. I should point out that sync, we're spelling S-Y-N-C. It's just S-Y-N-C, so we can do syncbookpress.com or thesyncbook.com. My own website is allthehappycreatures.com. Let's rejoin the conversation between Alan, Sabelle, Chipper, and Susan. It's funny to me is that there's, um, there's, there's people I, I deal with in the sync community who are so focused on the like seven layers down that I like to raise the question, does the second layer down does that is that still part of the conversation okay we noticed story circulating about what's what's popular right now right everyone's saying oh they're going to come for your guns uh you know this this sandy hook is a setup to erase the second amendment yeah uh so it's a pretty popular conspiracy thing right now right so that's maybe second layer down or third layer down well you know nine layers down we're looking at how the the people involved in the shooting, their names might be similar to some mythological uh, figure or some you know Gnostic narrative, and how this is telling the same story as every story in you know since the dawn of man, or or how this is completely the narrative of you know the Clue movie from 1986 or something, you know something something silly. 
And what we're, you know, we're able to do, and I'm not trying to make light of, of a horrible tragedy. I'm saying it's sometimes it is silly in that you're noticing this, this idea that this is all a setup or this is, is somehow a fictitious narrative. Well, in a weird sort of way, it's all a fictitious narrative. If, all right, well, let, let's go here. Let, let's go here because this, I'm kind of tiptoeing around the subject, but thank you. This, this, this Sandy Hook thing, right? This, this Sandy Hook shooting. I'm used to people who are picking out weird little tidbits in movies or events and going, you know, fixating on one little small little detail and blowing it up and saying how weird this is. This phrase, this Sandy Hook thing in the Batman movie, if someone showed me that as a media synchronicity, if it was a, someone's blog post, I'd think it was a lame synchronicity. I, w- I would be like, okay, yeah. And the level of weirdness that I'm used to at this point, I, again, this is why I come back to the idea of truth in advertising. I don't know if people are ready for how weird it really gets. I'm not saying that as trying to be, uh, oh, I'm so much more enlightened or so much more. I'm just saying when we talk about this idea of you can go two layers down or you can go nine layers down, I'm raising the question for the guy who's nine layers down saying, does two layers down still apply? Should we not still be concerned that, you know, the Federal Reserve just did something that, you know, if the Federal Reserve does something that uh, either causes inflation to go up and now I'm struggling to pay my bills. Well, that's just as real as, you know, this Gnostic narrative and this universal truth. Yeah, okay. Again, this is the importance of the left brain comes back in and says, hey, all that's important, but hold up, I got to pay my bills. So that second layer still applies very, very much so. But what we're doing, and I'm partially responsible for advocating this, is I've been advocating that the conspiracy guys need to start realizing that it's weirder than they think. And I've been advocating that, and now I'm at a point with the Sandy Hook thing, I'm at a point where I'm going, ooh, maybe they're not ready for it. Because the conspiracy uh, movement is used to fixating on a small connection that shouldn't be there. And then they're saying this is evidence of, obviously, some grander manipulation. So the conspiracy guys are basically also sink weavers, right? They're saying, yeah. hey, wait a second. Why does, right, why is the father of this shooter is connected to finance and then the, the, fa- you know, the father of the Aurora shooter is connected to finance and the father of Sandy Hook is connected to finance? Hey, that shouldn't be. Yeah, so you're writing here, right, this, like, live or banking scandal, right? It doesn't actually seem to be true. This is, um, it's, a hard, it's hard to back that up. Uh, the evidence doesn't seem to be there to really back that up as a, as a truth, but it's certainly, yes, it's certainly a synchronicity. Let's get there. Let's, let's uh, back up a second. So the, the conspiracy crowd is used to noticing two things that, for all intents and purposes, shouldn't be connected. Like, this doesn't seem to make sense. Hey, I'm going to fixate on that and try and dig into it. And it's sort of investigative journalism to an extent. We're also, our internet generation is very lazy about actually verifying data. So we develop a sort of conspiracy intuition, which is these two things aren't connected. I know that the media lies to me, which, yes, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you the media doesn't lie to you. The media is terrible. You know, you shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't be listening to it. But if you're going to take it from a conspiracy perspective, you sure as hell better try and validate it. You sure as hell better do your homework, double check, triple check, and f- to the best of your ability, and see if you're really going to go out there and argue that this is intentional. Don't just say it because Alex Jones told you. Don't just say it because someone else told you. Go out and do your research. Sometimes, and I think we're all guilty of this sometimes, is if you got a, a source that you trust okay, you know, well, Alex Jones was right, you know, the last nine times, okay, I'm going to trust that what he says today is the truth. On our radio show, 42 Minutes, we had James Evan Pilato. He does Media Monarchy. He's connected with James Corbett. They do New World next week, right? Now, these are guys who do very straight-laced investigative journalism. That's what they're used to. And James was talking about he started working with a radio show out of Portland called uh, Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis. 
which I've actually appeared on Clyde's show. I mean, you know, very, very nice guys. Uh, I really enjoy both of them. But he was talking about when this shooting happened, there was the temptation to go on the air and start invest, you know, and start talking about it and doing a radio show that they do a daily radio show. And he was saying the temptation was there to go out and do a radio show that day and talk about it. And James said, let's wait. Let's just wait a few days, do all our homework first, even though it's, you know, this is like CNN, you know, you don't want to fall into the trap of CNN. Is CNN just this evil media control system? Yes, but it's also a built-in flaw to the very idea of 24-hour news is they got to go out there and say something, and they don't know what the hell's going on. There's no way you can know. The shooting just happened five minutes ago. And then everyone's going to go on the internet and go, hey, they reported something that what turned out to not be true. They must be lying. Yeah, they could be lying or they could also be just making shit up because they have to go on air and talk about it. And they're going to say, well, it could be this or it could be this. So we, we have to try and figure out to discern a little bit where, where do the mistakes come in, where is the, the misreporting come in, and then not to do that ourselves. So that's, that's one complaint I would have is that we, we seem to just kind of repeat this stuff. But again, so this conspiracy crowd is used to picking up on these things that don't fit, and then they are plugging it into their reality, which their reality is, okay, the Federal Reserve or a David Rockefeller controls the planet, and here's something that doesn't seem to fit with what should be happening, or here's some connection that doesn't make sense. It's obviously part of the agenda. And what I'm here to say is, if you're at the point where you're going to fixate on one little frame of a movie and say this is evidence of some mass mind control whatever you're not prepared for how weird it really gets okay so i'm i'm seeing so patterns exist yeah you know we patterns exist and you know psychic leaking i think exist especially in art yes so i can see a pattern something happened there that's it's actually truly a coincidence so then what's weirder than that? I mean, when you're talking about it gets weirder, what, what are you saying about that? Okay, well, there's, there's a number of things, right? So, so on one level, we have what are honest coincidences. And I do, just, for, just to be fair, I'm also a guy who tries to be the voice of reason is not everything is a coincidence. When the Congress said that, hey, we need to have you know, airport scanners in every airport – and it turns out they all owned shares in the company that makes these things. That's not a coincidence. It's not a synchronicity. No, that asshole's trying to steal your money. He's trying <laughs> yeah. to manipulate something. That's not. So let's, let's, let's call. This is the hard part, though, is we get into these gray areas. where like, that is not a coincidence. That's pretty good evidence of manipulation. Something else. But, but to say, though, obviously there are things, particularly in art, which we can call psychic leaking. I think that's a great phrase. It's probably as good a phrase as we're going to get. But something seems to happen. And I, speaking as an artist, I have know that it, it's happened to me over and over and over again where something that I'm doing is just purely artistically and then that same sort of thing seems to happen in the quote-unquote real world, in consensus reality. Now, you can take a solipsistic point of view that I made that happen or we could say that somehow to the very nature of being an artist means you're dipping into that right brain, you're swimming in that subconscious, that non-linear temporal realm where all things are timeless and somehow you're picking up, even unintentionally, you're picking up on some future thing. I also do think it's possible to, if you learn how to navigate that realm, to kind of pick up on future events and whether that be in a web bot like process or a Goro Adachi type process where you're able to essentially accurately predict future events. You know, there, we are able to do these things. I spent a few months in my blog really exploring that concept, testing it out just to see if it was even possible before dissecting whether or not it was useful or not, just to answer that question to my satisfaction. And I, I spent a few months on my blog where I was just trying to use these patterns as a way of predicting future events. And I, to my satisfaction, I was very successful. And then the conversation gets raised. I have some friends within the sync community who say, <laughs> my friend Will, he says, of course sync predicts the future. What's the point? What's the point? 
mm. because because if you if you're pointing to a nonlinear aspect of reality, is what's more interesting that you were able to tell the future or that you have to real, figure out how to live in a nonlinear reality? <laughs> you know, so these are again excellent questions. But my my point is, when you say it gets weirder, is to say the questions that get raised is if artists consistently are kind of predicting the future in their artwork. And that doesn't mean that I'm saying uh, that I'm discounting propaganda or perhaps even some cases of predictive programming. I just think that that's a, a sort of crutch phrase that the conspiracy movements use that I think is ultimately naive and, and it's, it's a bullshit answer. I'm sorry. To say everything's predictive programming, oh, they put it in there. No, it's so I can much. see that coexisting, but not being exclusive. Right, exactly. So I think predictive, in my experience, and just as, as someone who's really studying more that side of like how often these things happen, that we can find connections or that there seems to be some future portent. Again, it's not just media because I think what ultimately what sort of reminds me that it's not just media is because we'll be having a conversation with you know in with amongst my friends or my family or whatever it is and some aspect of that conversation will come up in the news event later that day that everything is sort of an echo of the, of everything else to such a degree that if you're really paying attention to it you you see it but most people aren't dissecting their their conversation with their you know they take their cat to the vet and there's a, you know, a magazine sitting on the table and there's some family sitting on the other side of the room having a conversation. You're not picking apart those pieces because you're not thinking they're part of some grand conspiracy. Those are just little data bits flying all around you. And OK, there's a magazine there and the doctor said this to me and oh, I passed this billboard on the way home. This is all information that your brain is used to filtering out. This is how we stay sane more often than not is we have natural filters in our brain to say that's all you know, extra, extra uh, sensory input that I don't need. What do I really need to know? I need to know don't run over the mailbox, stop at the red light. This is again, you know, your left brain kind of takes over and says just pay attention to what's important. Or you're distracted with some, you know, chasing your kid around or whatever it might be. My thing is, in, in that case, right, since we're not used to that, but then we are used to looking at um, anything that seems like it's part of the system, the control system, we're used to tearing that apart. Oh, look, there's a movie that came out of Hollywood. I know that that's controlled or here's something I saw on TV. It's obviously manipulation. I hope I make myself clear. It's not that I'm saying there isn't manipulation. I'm just saying we're so used to picking those things apart and not the other things. So then once you start picking those other things apart, you realize those same things are there. So if the, the person that I was standing next to in the grocery line predicted the future just as much as Dark Knight Returns or you know some movie, well, what does that mean? Does that person is that person a plant? This is how people start getting to the really dark mental realms because they start deciding this is, you know, it's the matrix. Some things, you know, this is all part of some grand uh, Gnostic black iron prison. Oh, that that's just there because, uh, you know, that guy's a CIA agent. I'm being followed by a CIA agent. Possible. Yeah, that, then you could start to get lost in, in almost paranoid schizophrenic thinking. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a huge danger. You know, I think what I'm trying to say is that to balance out paranoid schizophrenia with healthy paranoia, there is such a thing as healthy paranoia, right? Um, yeah. Uh, how do we balance those things? That's such a delicate psychic dance that you have to do. It's like you're essentially dancing over a you know a pit of lava, you know, tiptoeing across it, and you can very easily fall to either side. And that's just like a dangerous realm. It's full of, if you can handle it, it's, the, it's really worth it. I mean, these are like in hugely important spiritual insights. This is, um, let's kind of just say this. Uh, I, I know we're kind of hitting all these little tangents, but there's something like the old mystery schools, this, particularly like the Dionysian, Dionysian mystery cults. If anyone studies the Dionysian mystery cults, you'll notice that there is a sort of warning, a, a caution 
that they knew how easily it would be for their rites and rituals, their practices, their explorations to fall into either hedonism or insanity or all this sort of stuff. And what I'm realizing is that modern day synchromysticism and all the people who don't even realize they're practicing synchromysticism, the guy who's on the internet just trying to find out what the hell is going on, or the guy who's hunting conspiracies and starts making connections and doesn't realize what he's doing. We're not warning everyone, hey, you're practicing a form of intellectual juggling that you better know what you're getting into. If I handed someone, I made this comment always recorded the other day, if I handed someone LSD, I would give them a really, hey, I'm telling you I'm going to give you something that's going to challenge your perception of reality. Yet, you can go to Target and buy an iPhone, which is just gives you access to every piece of information that, you know, the human experience has collected. And we don't put a warning on that. We just say, hey, you probably shouldn't use it while you're driving. What about this is a psychedelic object? The iPhone, the Internet, these are hugely psychedelic objects that will forever change and challenge your perception of reality. We don't talk about that. Alan, if do you think that right now the filters that we normally put on our brains and our minds that used to filter all this stuff out because it was too overwhelming, do you think they're falling away or do you think that we're just more aware of things and so look for them or combination thereof what's your thoughts on that uh i would say it's probably a combination i definitely think we're learning to handle more you know the guy who uh i don't know you go back even a hundred years ago what you know how much data did you have to really process you know of course you're still processing you know, your livestock and things like that. You know, let's say you're a man working on a farm a hundred years ago, you're processing a certain amount of stimulus around you. You know, oh, make sure there isn't a wolf coming. You know, you have certain basic needs of what you need to process. Now let's fast forward 50 years. Someone now has a television for the first time. Okay, now Mm. they're they're watching television and there's a real human being sitting on the couch next to them, and there's some projected image of a person on a screen in front of them, and you have to maybe this extra level of sensory input. Well, now you look at a TV screen, and there's like words scrolling across the bottom and different images flashing up and 10 people talking at once, and you're looking at that while checking your phone, while driving, while, (laughs) you know, we definitely are learning how to multitask. Look at what's, what did Microsoft Windows, probably the most universal home computer thing, what did it really teach us how to do? It it taught us how to multitask, right? And now we're at a point where we have 35 different screens uh, open on our computer and five different browsers and, you know, you're listening to this and you're still trying to have a conversation. We, of course, there's a danger of overstimulating ourselves. There's all sorts of things we we could kind of dissect here. But I guess what I'm saying is we're definitely, we definitely figured out how to take in more more information. I remember being uh, in high school. My friend worked. He was a, like some sort of stock investor, and he had a job where what he would do is read financial articles into uh, a tape recorder. The woman was blind, and so she couldn't read all these articles. So what he would do is he'd go to work and pick up a magazine and start reading into a tape recorder, and then she would take all these things. And what he told me is that she would listen to nine of them at once. And I always thought, how the hell could this woman hear nine different articles being read to her at the same time and process them all? So I'm just saying she's some sort of savant, which is probably true. This, I'm sure this woman was undoubtedly brilliant. But then you look at your average person who we, you know, again, not to be offensive, but like the guy who goes to just your, your average guy can look at a computer screen and see Again, those, you know, text scrolling across the bottom and all these different things popping up. And he's somehow able to process essentially nine different things at once. Maybe not to the same skill level that she does. Of course, we have room for subliminal implanting by marketing companies. There are, you know, if you want to talk conspiracy, you know, that's that's very, very real. There's a way to overstimulate somebody or sneak things in. But my point is, 
your average human being is essentially able to process nine different things going on at once. We, it's just a skill we've sort of uh, developed. We're adapting to swimming in this, in, you know, internet-based data stream or media-based data stream. Since we are adapting to it, it's a skill we're developing. Um, mm. Again, probably not with as much skill as that woman that my, my friend used to work for, but I definitely were collectively developing that skill. So part of it is a changing landscape. Part of it is a skill we're developing. And then on that sort of psycho-spiritual level, we have to assume it's always been there. That level of interconnected cosmos has always been there. We just probably hadn't yet developed that skill, how to process that bird chirping, that car driving down the road, this happening all at once. And what we're slowly starting to develop is how to pay attention to all those things and drop some of those filters, let in a little more information, let in a little more information. Just be careful you don't drown is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, and maybe there aren't so many saber-toothed tigers around to to chase after us, and so we can do it now, too, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we don't have saber-toothed tigers, right, but, you know, what do we have? We have uh, some company who wants to sell us Cheerios, and some other company wants <laughs> to sell us this, and... Yeah, right, right. Monsanto's probably much worse for you than uh, Sabretooth Tiger. I mean, they both kill you in the end, but I'll take the Sabretooth Tiger over Monsanto any day. So, yeah, uh, it's easier to figure out anyway. <laughs> Isn't that a synonymous expression of what you were trying to say earlier about the right side of the brain is is increasing its play area? Sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned Monsanto. I mean, I was just playing with that the other day. Now, this, you know, you, there will be people out there who will go, uh, I'm going to dissect for you a corporate logo or a corporate name, and I'm going to show you that it's really this Luciferian plot behind the scenes to, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is, I'm telling you what it, the honest answer is, this is just me playing. I was thinking about the word Monsanto just a few days ago, and the, the word mon, M-O-N, right? This is like mono, it means right. one. San, S-A-N, this is without. And then T-O, we could think of as either um, giving or we might could see it as a play on the number two. So it's the pure monopoly. It's one without there being any other second or without giving to anything else. Simple little, like, playful wordplay. Um, and I mean that very seriously. Wordplay. This doesn't have to be serious. You know, I, I had somebody... Uh, I had a friend who was interested in like these different kind of researchers, and he's like, "There are some. There's some guy. Um, oh God, I can't remember the researcher's name, but it was who was basically arguing like, well, there's like this etymological connection. It's like, no, there's there isn't. You know, that's that's not true. You can't say that there's some etymological connection between some obscure word in Persian, some Navajo language, but." It might be a synchronicity. It might point to some universal truth that why does a human being think this sound means something to this to a completely different culture? And this is why I guess I'm saying we need to make a distinction what we're arguing. That's sort of like the conspiracy to, to argue there's an etymological root, which in some cases might be. I'm, I'm, I hope you realize I'm not just blanket statement. Right. There's no no such thing as etymology. I'm saying yeah. there are some people who make really. Um, there may <laughs> really be a, thin uh, argument. There may be a sonic <laughs> correlation with the, yeah. the way that sound hits the brain and causes yeah. its cascades. Yeah. Well, something I keep like this is a sort of phrase I keep coming back to is like there is a connection. What we're all doing, whether you're a synchromystic, 